Good morning, everybody. Glad to see you all here on this cold, non-winter morning, but we had flurries at the Carter household this morning. I'm sure some of you saw some flurries where you were as well. And uh, we want to welcome you to Ignite. If you can see, we have some new decorations on stage this morning. A whole bunch of Operation Christmas Child boxes. And uh, I know there will be a lot more coming in. We're pretty close to our goal. I don't know if we're uh, there or over yet, but I know we're getting closer to it. So, uh, But this morning what I would ask is if you're able, would you stand with us? We're going to open up in a word of prayer. And we're going to pray over these boxes. And then uh, we will dive right into worship. So would you pray with me this morning? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day you've given us. I thank you that we are able to be here today in this sanctuary, worshiping you, Father, praising your name. And I thank you for all of these boxes, Father. I thank you for the souls that filled these and the paid for the shipping for them and all those things, Father. I pray that the gospel will be spread to so many different countries and nations this year. God, that your will would be done, that these young children would be brought to a saving knowledge of you even through the small gifts that we have provided for them, Father. So thank you for those who have given, Father, and help us to reach the goal that we've set for our church. And God, we ask that your hand of blessing would be with us today here in church and that your name would be honored and glorified in all that is done. Lord Jesus, have your way. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. It's an open 
Well, amen. We're going to continue worshiping this morning. I did want to take just one quick um, pastoral prerogative, if you will. And uh, even though we are now past Veterans Day, this is the Sunday that we will be celebrating Veterans Day. So are there any veterans in our crowd out there today? I know Rom's back there, and there's Mike back there as well. Thank you guys so much for your service. You are a blessing not only to this nation, but to your congregation and fellow brothers as well. So thank you very much. Amen. And uh, <clears throat> something we can, I think this next song is so fitting for a Veterans Day celebration because it can be a reminder to us that uh, we need to be revived, thinking of the, those who have honored and sacrificed for our nation, that uh, we need to be revived as a church. Sing with us, revive us again. church, if we would just allow ourselves to be filled by the Holy Spirit, remembering that he is the cornerstone of our faith, and he is the cornerstone of all things of this earth.
Jesus' name. Sing that verse again. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I cannot trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ standing before your throne, giving you all the honor, the glory, and the praise. Father God, allow your Holy Spirit to come and fill this place, fill your people today. Lord, help us to listen to the words preached today, to know that you truly are our living hope in this world of tumultuous times, Father. Have your way in us and through us and in all ways here at Central Trinity, Father. We love you, praise you, and thank you. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Good morning. How is everybody this morning? Hopefully, have, ah, having a good day after we're worshiping together. That's always a fun thing. And uh, listening to Jeff and John and uh, usually Caitlin, but, but she couldn't make it in here this morning. And uh, But we're, we're glad that you guys are in here. 
And this is uh, a sermon that I was looking into and thinking about uh, doing for quite a while. And as John likes to remind me, there's going to be a song as a part of the sermon that it is an Easter song and not uh, almost Christmas Thanksgiving song. And I said, I know that, but it's a pretty one too. So, uh, but the song was something that really moved me, and it's a it's a living hope is what it's called by Phil Wickham, and he's going they're going to sing it here in the middle of the sermon. But uh, there, it's it's ironic because see, oftentimes he'll he'll look at the things that I've given him, and then he'll make slides too, and. Uh, it's very unique that he has the little heart sign there because um, I don't even know. My mom and dad are here this morning. I don't know if my dad will remember me calling about this. But uh, when we were in Washington Courthouse, we uh, had just arrived there. I think it was about my Lisa Nye's third or fourth day uh, present there. And the senior pastor that was there, I was the associate working with the youth, had been waiting for us to like move in and get settled because he hadn't gone on vacation in like a year and a half. And so he immediately handed over the reins of the church uh, to this 25 year old kid out of seminary and, and left and went on vacation. He said, no one's really sick, no one's gonna die, none of these things. Well that night, uh, we get home and uh, I get a phone call and it's from one of my older members and she had taken her husband to the hospital, it was like two o'clock in the morning. I went in there and he was already in the stages of passing away. Uh, so mind you, I'm fresh out of seminary, just moved into the town, don't really know anybody. And actually, this was my first real church other than the one that I did during seminary or the ones I did when I was younger. And I was flipping out just a little bit because if, if you've ever been present when someone passes away, there's a couple of different things that they go through. Uh, yeah, and I'm not going to explain them all to you because it's not really a time place to do that here. But one of those moments is if you're present when that person passes away, you know, the little ticking of that. Uh, what's that called, Kelly? Yeah, an EKG there that shows you whether a person's still heart still beating or what starts to go away. And. Uh, it's been so long ago that I don't even remember his name, his fam the family's name, because it was about 20, 27 years ago that I did this. But uh, I, I got a little scared because the emergency room doctor said, well, if you're going to say a prayer for him, you probably should because he's not going to make it much longer. And uh, I got ready to, and I called my dad and said, you know, I'm it's 2 o'clock in the morning and I'm in the hospital here and I'm not really sure how I'm supposed to go about this, and so he gave me a little pep talk, and I went and did it. Well, I, I prayed for this man, and as I said, he was slowly passing away as I was praying for him uh, until eventually, as we finished, his EKG flatlined, and he had passed, passed away. Now, there was about an hour and a half, two hours right before that that was very, very difficult for his wife, for me, for his kids. Uh, but I'll never forget that beeping noise stopping. Uh, because what that means is what? You are ceasing to be alive. But I'll never forget what his wife said after that happened. I was so, so nervous and uh, worried that I wouldn't say the right things. And I think she sensed that. And she said, Pastor, it's okay. He may not be living, but we have the hope in Christ and know where he's going. And I never forgot that. 20, about 27 years ago, that lady said that to me as her husband was passing away. So here's someone ministering to their new pastor as the new pastor is trying to minister to a family. And living hope is, it's just one of the most amazing things that being saved can give you. Because ultimately what you're doing is, is your heart you're giving your heart to Jesus. You're letting Jesus come into your life and change every little thing. So no longer are you just living, but you're a living, walking, breathing hope. And what's great about that is because that is literally the thing that God wants us to do the most, which is to be that hope in the world until coming in on the clouds, and Jesus will be coming back 
and what a glorious day that will be. And I wanted to share that story with you before I read um, this first scripture. And if you uh, can put that one up, Stephanie, it's uh, the Romans one, Romans 15, 8 through 13. And before I say that, I'll say this. If you are like me and you like to learn what things mean related to uh, real world, to scripture, if you look up hope, what it actually says in quite a few dictionaries, but I looked it up in Webster's, and uh, it's a feeling of expectation, but then it adds something else at the end, or trust. Now, that's sometimes not a word that we often think of related to a living uh, to hope, even in general, because what we're doing in hope is we are hoping for the best, right? Those of you that are in here that grew up in a uh, era where your parents, grandparents maybe said, well, you hope for the best and prepare for the worst, right? That's the, the saying. I think actually that's a military saying, maybe even too, right? Hope for the best, pray for the worst, or <laughs> hope, for, you know what I mean, yeah, but uh, that probably is not a military saying. <laughs> well, but you have that, that thing, and so here's the expectation and trust, and you're, you're expecting hope because you're waiting, which goes really greatly with here in two weeks when we start Advent, because Advent literally is waiting on the coming of the Christ child. And so you are having that expectation of what life will be like for you, but you also have trust that if you're a Christian that God will take care of you. And that's a wonderful thing. And here's what these verses say. They're in Romans, and Paul's writing here, and this is, this is what he's reaching out to them about. And you have to think of the time period here. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed. And moreover, the, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing the praises of your name. Again, it says, rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will rise to rule over the nations. In him, the Gentiles will hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Beautiful words. And that last uh, verse there, verse 13, uh, if you grew up in the era of, you know, giving the preacher giving a benediction, especially in the Methodist church at the end of the service, often that would be something that they might say. And so may that God of hope fill you, joy, peace, trust, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now that's a lot uh, to take in there, but what, what Paul is feeling compelled to do is he's wanting to remind uh, his readers of this great example that they can put forth, which is the difference between the Jews, and the Gentiles. And if you didn't get it by the reading or the following along, where are the Gentiles, right? If you're looking at this from later on in life, we are the ones that this is directed to along with them because what it's saying is, is it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, or what you're about, but God loves us all the same. That is a concept in church that often church people find difficult because here's what we'll say. And I'll put myself in this, but whoever, all of us in this, uh, if you've ever been in a church, one of the things that each and every church always says is, well, we want to grow. We want to have new people come in. We want to have young people come in. We want to have little ones come in. We want to have whatever. And they want all these things. And then when these things happen, then they say, but we didn't want all those people in here. We didn't want those young people that were here and, uh, you know, on a whatever night having a church lock-in with pizza and whatever else, and then some kid ran through the sanctuary and stepped on a big piece of pizza and skidded, and there's mozzarella and tomato sauce all the way down the aisle. 
I have literally had those things happen, Lisa and I. We get yelled at for those things when the kids were younger and we were doing that all the time. And you know what I would say is the same thing every time. That doesn't really matter. It does not matter. Now, I know for a fact that there are certain people that if I say that it doesn't matter, they are nodding their heads saying, no, it doesn't. But in the background, they're like, yes, it does. <laughs> because there would be a killing for that, right? One of my favorite preachers of all time, Mike Iaconelli, he some call him the founder of youth ministry in the 60s and 70s. He wasn't. He was just a, just a guy that wanted to love on kids and give them some hope. But he used to always say, if you aren't fired as a youth leader over the church carpet one time in your life, then you're not really a youth minister. And he always had this saying, which I assume came from his real life, because he would call those moments the, uh, the Jones Memorial Carpet. <laughs> Right? You know those. We look around the church and uh, it's the Jones Memorial Carpet and it's the uh, Clark and Smith uh, vestibule. And, uh, you know, we got that beautiful upper room that you can go up there and pray in. And that's sponsored by the Shell family or whoever else, you know. You got these names. And we worry about that kind of stuff when ultimately it does not matter. Right? What matters is that we come into this place, and it's a beautiful place that we've done so much with, but if it gets spilled on, spit on, thrown up, whatever babies do, whatever little kids do, uh, we've, had church, we've had churches that we've been at that somehow uh, kids got a hold of crayons and parents didn't see, and all the pews were decorated with artwork, and it doesn't matter. Because what Paul is saying here is, is those of you that have hope and it fills you with joy and peace and all those things, you're not placing your trust in the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit has a whole different kind of idea of hope. And it's the hope in Christ. That's what it's all about, right? And so when we come in here, we're here to show people the direction that they need to go uh, in their lives, but also at the same time, we're here to not hold their hands so that they can't go anywhere and do any damage, but we're here to hold their hands so that we can say, we're going with you out into this world. That's great. That literally is uh, the, what we're called to do. A lot of times uh, in today's world, we use literally in the wrong sense, but that literally is the right sense. We are told directly, indirectly, all those things throughout the Bible, go and make it, make disciples in all the nations, baptizing the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, that doesn't mean that you got to go out and start baptizing people, Right? I'm not talking about uh, Darren's going to go home to his house and add an addition on his house with an indoor swimming pool. It's heated, and he's going to say, come one, come all, Zanesville, and I'm going to baptize you because my preacher said that I can do it. So, no, that's not what it is, right? It's not for you to baptize. It's for the preacher to baptize. But what it is for you to do is to baptize someone uh, in the Holy Spirit by praying for them, by trying to get them to where they need to be so that when they wake up in the morning, they don't feel crushed by the weight of the world. Because I've been there, you've been there. But if there truly is a living hope, that makes so much different. And so Paul here is telling the readers, remember, this is not just for you, but it's for the Gentiles. It's for uh, everyone. And so don't leave anyone out. What are the times in your life that you have been somewhere and God has nudged you about something mentally, spiritually, and you know that there's something at that moment that you're supposed to do, but you don't do it? And you missed an opportunity. Is that living in hope? No, that's more like hoping that when we die, that when God passes a judgment on us to see if we're ready to get into heaven and, and be the believer, 
that'll probably be one of those moments where we're sitting down watching the movies of our life and he stops the tape, rolls it back, stops the tape, rolls it back, stops the tape. That would bother me, right? One of the things that makes it hardest is whenever you try to be helpful uh, for those that have no hope, and then the next thing you know, they've burned you on it, right? There's so many problems like that in the world. There's homelessness. There's those that sit at the street corners, you know, and need a little bit of change or some money. And you're thinking back to that time that you handed one of them uh, 20 bucks and it was the last in your wallet. And you thought that was a really good deed that I did. And then a couple days later, you see them in that same spot and they got the little brown bag and they're <laughs> drinking whatever else out of it. Right. And you're like, why do I why do I trust? Because you're not just trusting you are trying to share your hope with someone else. And that's what we're called to do. But ultimately, we are to help others have that living hope in them. It's not that hard to figure out. But what makes it hard is, is then to be able to show that God really is true to you, to me, just as he was to Moses and Abraham, Joshua, whoever, when he was leading them to where he wanted them to go. And he said to them, trust me, I will take you to where you need to be. And so he came and gave that hope to the Gentiles. And in that again, is where right before what's on the screen there in verse 12, it said the root of Jesse will spring up because Paul was preaching here and he was talking about how important it was because ultimately what happened then is the Savior of the world came and they didn't even know it. So many didn't realize who was standing in their midst. And so I say to you on this day, who's standing in ours? In the midst of this town and the place that we live are many that are hopeless. They're not hopeful. Their hope has been stomped on, dragged, dragged down the middle, and the pizza sauce is everywhere, the cheese, and no more is it a good pizza. It's carpet pizza. <laughs> and it's carpet hope. It's no longer that living hope. Your EKG has died down, and there's nothing. And it's because not that we're heartless, but that we have often been like Pharaoh and turned our hearts hard because we're afraid that we're going to get burned by someone who really doesn't need the, the help and the hope that we want to give. And again, God says to us, bring me everyone and I'll have enough hope for all of us. It's a promise that's made. It begins in the Old Testament. And it finishes up in the New Testament. If you follow along, it's a theme that's there all along. Is that Jesus came as a servant to show that God is true to his promises that he made to his ancestors in the beginning. And so Christ came so that the Gentiles might also give glory to God for his mercies to them. And what that means is that God is a God of hope. He is the source of eternal hope, life and salvation. He is the object of hope for every believer. And ultimately, in his name, is the power of hope. And folks, I'm telling you today, they're going to play that song and if you don't get and understand that living hope is for you you've got to let go of what's keeping you from it so that you can share that moment with others just listen to the words of this song How great the chasm 
Bye. 
Stephanie, if you could put that other scripture up there. First, first Peter. The, the second scripture, the second scripture, is it on there? First Peter 1, 3 through 5 says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. These are some of the most important words that you can hear or that you can read this morning because that living hope is for you and for me. There's no limit on it. There's no chains that hold it down. And that living moment Peter is talking about here is trying to get and identify with the hurting people that he's talking to. And I'm sharing to you this morning, all of us are, that if that's you and you're hurting and you're scared, you're down, you're listening this morning and you hear that, you're listening later on some other time, then I'm telling you this, it breaks through whatever it is that's holding you down. Because in Jesus Christ, God has given us a living hope and is not dependent on our environment that we live in, our outward circumstances, or the job that we have that we don't like or the kids that we have that we're raising and it's so difficult and hard because that living hope will break through it all. And so this morning, as they sing through that chorus one more time, let God release from you those chains that are holding you back. And this morning, if you didn't hear anything else, know that there is salvation in the name of Jesus Christ. And in that name, it is above all other names. Is a living hope for you and for me, for both the Jews and the Gentiles. If only we believe. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Will you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, you are our living hope, and we bask in that this morning. The mercy, the salvation, the grace, all those things that we have that you give to us that makes us who we are. And we ask this morning that whether someone's watching uh, this service or they're here in person, that they let that living hope break through those chains that are holding them down, that are keeping them from what God wants them and where God wants them to be. And we just give that to you this morning, Father, and we thank you that we're able to be here in this church and worship you 
that there isn't ways that are being done to try to keep us back. Because, Father, I, I know that when we need to be in places together, the world tries to keep us apart. And I ask, Father, that you have us join all hearts this morning as we remember that living hope that is you. And it's in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming this morning.